All right, Keith Swenson is no stranger here. He's a friend to all of us, but I will read a little background for you. Dr. Keith Swenson is a retired medical doctor who now teaches courses in biology and geology at Multnomah County, Multnomah University in Portland, Oregon. He also served for 20 years as president of Portland's Design Science Association and was on the board of the Seven Wonders Museum near Mount St. Helens. Keith especially enjoys leading field trips and has taken hundreds, uh, hundreds to the Mount St. Helens, to the Columbia River Gorge and Northwest Forests and the Grand Canyon. Uh, Keith has a BS in zoology from the University of Idaho and an MD from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He and his wife Connie have four grandchildren. Let's all give a warm welcome to Keith Swenson. Well, good morning, everybody. Have any of you ever gone out to the Columbia Gorge and looked for wildflowers? Quite a few. Good. It's a good activity. And uh, what I'd like to do is give you a little mini course in the gorge wildflowers, just kind of the information you need to know to appreciate the flowers even more. And, of course, base it upon a biblical understanding of plant life. So, our topic is wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge. Now Solomon in the Song of Songs says, see the winter is past, the rains are over and gone. Well, maybe not quite yet, <laughs> but they will be soon. And then he continues, flowers appear on the earth, and that is happening as we speak, particularly east of Hood River and the Columbia Gorge. Here are two early bloomers that I photographed uh, on February 19th, 2020. Who can identify those? Grass widows, yes, that's the right answer. Sometimes they even find these in January, I'm told. I don't usually get up there then. So anybody recognize this early flowering species? Aha, I gotcha. Columbia Desert Parsley. And you can see from the debris around this plant that uh, it grows to be quite large. That was last year's growth. And uh, it appears really early in the spring, and what comes up first are the, are the flowers. <clears throat> and then the leaves, you can barely see them underneath, are starting to come as well. And these plants are endemic. Uh, that is, uh, they're endemic to the East Gorge and to the Klickitat Valley. An endemic species is a plant species that's found only in a defined location on Earth and nowhere else. And there's said to be 15 species that are endemic to the Columbia Gorge, found only there. Anybody identify that one? That's yellow bells. It's a small lily family plant. It blooms in the early spring, often right after snow melt. So there are perhaps 1,500 species of flowering plants in the Columbia Gorge. <clears throat> no one knows, has an exact answer. Uh, here's a quote from Oregon State University botany professor Kenton Chambers, and he wrote this. He says, in the entire Pacific Northwest region, no other area has a concentration of species equal to that found in this one river canyon. So in this program, I'll give you an overview of this tremendous floral diversity and hopefully <clears throat> giving you a better appreciation or greater understanding of these wildflowers in the Columbia Gorge. But first, I want to turn to our foundational source of uh, <clears throat> information, which, of course, is the Bible, and so including plant life. This is our foundation for understanding these things. So what do the scriptures exactly say about uh, plant life? Passage in Genesis 1 explains the origin of plants, which was on day three of creation week. And it reads, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit with, in which is their seed, and each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed according to their kind. 
Now, I can make uh, three observations on this text. Uh, first of all, God's method of creation was uh, He simply spoke plants into existence. And secondly, plant life did not start in some primordial form or even as seeds. It appears that newly created plants were functionally mature plants, already having fruit containing seeds. And then the other thing I observe here is this phrase, according to their kinds, which repeats over and over again. Let me expand a little bit on that because it's terribly important. Uh, <clears throat> it's important, I think, that you understand this diagram. I've shown it before. Some of you may have seen it. But it concerns the created kinds or baramans. Now, in Genesis 1, it talks about created kinds. And baraman is simply a word that's been coined from two Hebrew terms, bara meaning uh, create and mean or men meaning kind. So these are synonyms. And uh, many people uh, in the past and certainly today even believe that biblical creationists do not hold to any sort of change in plants or animals. That is, there's no formation of adaptations or of uh, new species and such. But that simply is not true. Uh, Genesis tells us that God created various kinds. He didn't say species. And these created kinds were to re reproduce after their kinds. And modern creationist biologists generally believe that cr each created kind was programmed with a range of capabilities. Uh, that is, many of which were hidden, things that could be used future in the, in the uh, plant as it moves into different areas, for example. Some people call this mediated design. And so as plants and animals spread over the earth after creation, and after Noah's flood, they diversified. Uh, new adaptations were expressed as they needed them and appropriate for each new habitat that they went into, and new species formed. But the important point is that all of this change remains strictly within the created kind. Uh, in terms of animals, for example, no dinosaurs transitioned into birds. Uh, this modern view of creation can be thought of as an orchard, shown here. This is an orchard near Mosier. And uh, as you see the trees, uh, look at the tree on the right, which is labeled as a rose, basically the rose family. And you can see that uh, the roses would have started at the base of that tree in creation week. And then as time passes, that is, as you go higher in the tree, uh, there was diversification. Uh, it branches out. There are different species that have formed, different Nanutka rose, the Sweetbriar rose, the pear hip rose, on and on we can go, and even all the cultivars from uh, human uh, uh, breeding of, of roses. But all the plants on here stayed on the same tree. They didn't start new trees, they didn't jump to another tree. You can see the parsley tree, the buttercup tree, and the pea family plants uh, in another tree. And then we could put all the animals in here and all living things, really, on this sort of an orchard of life. And we, of course, contrast this with the evolution view, which is a single tree of life, where there was an original spark of life, and then from that, all life came on the same tree, so that uh, we are actually related to the plants and to the fungi and all the animals and so forth. So a single tree of life is the evolution view. Multiple trees, uh, such as an orchard, portrays the, uh, the biblical creation view. So I hope that is, is clear, and that's extremely important. Uh, Genesis uh, 1 also tells us that plants were given as food for both man and animals. Originally, everybody was a vegetarian. Man was not given permission to eat meat until after the flood. And uh, the text um, says here, uh, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. Uh, but that might bring up a problem in some people's minds, because in modern biology we speak of plants as living organisms, and, which, and when they're eaten, they die. But creationists believe that there is no, was no death uh, before the fall of man. So how do we resolve this issue? And I think the answer is that plants, unlike animals, are not alive in the biblical sense. They do not, therefore, die in the biblical sense. In contrast, animals, 
like of the sea and the air and the land, possess life. And the Hebrew word there is nephesh. And so these that possess life are capable of dying in a biblical sense. A couple of scriptures here I have put up. Uh, Genesis 1.21 said, So God created the great sea creatures and every living nephesh creature that moves. And Genesis 1.24 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living nephesh creatures, livestock and creeping things and the beasts of the earth. But the Bible in no place says uh, that plants possess nephesh. So again, plants, according to modern biology, are alive and do die, but biblically plants are not alive and do not, therefore, truly die. That seems to make sense. Genesis 1 uh, says that man was given dominion over the creation, uh, and it talks about his dominion here over the, the animals of the earth. And of course, if man has dominion over the animals of the earth, he also has to have uh, dominion over and be responsible for the stewardship of plants upon which all animals depend. So I think we, are, uh, we have that mandate for caring for the entirety of the creation. Uh, the Bible also says that uh, God made plants beautiful, Genesis 2.9. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And notice this uh, verse spoken by Jesus uh, in Luke 12. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, arrayed like one of these. Here's our beautiful tiger lily, which blooms in the West Gorge in June. God also pronounced his completed creation as good. Actually, he says very good here in Genesis 1.31. But the good creation didn't last long. Uh, following man's sin, God said, Cursed is the ground because of you, thorns and thistles that shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. The curse, it appears, made uh, it more difficult to grow food crops. Somehow the ground had changed, and weedy and invasive plants began to compete with crops. Something like that must have happened. Here is a Perfect uh, example of a plant of the curse, the yellow star thistle. It's an aggressive, invasive plant that's taking over roadsides and other disturbed areas in the east end of the gorge, and a lot of effort is made to con to being made to control it. Well, finally, uh, from the point, uh, standpoint of the Bible, we should mention Noah's flood. The flood, of course, would have destroyed the plant life of uh, the pre-flood world, but plants would also have survived uh, as seeds and parts of plants and so forth. Uh, many of them would be in floating log mats or floating vegetation mats on the waters. And when the waters went down, these mats grounded and uh, many plants recovered and uh, started to grow again. And that would include the ancestors of the plants we find in the Columbia Gorge. And the other thing about the flood is, it, in addition to its effect on biology, it was the geological processes associated with the late flood and the post-flood ice age period that actually formed the Columbia Gorge. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Well, here's a, a classical view of the gorge from Women's Forum State Park. So let me now just describe the geography, geology, and a little bit of the history of the gorge and uh, <clears throat> as it uh, impacts plants. And as I do, uh, think about the question, of why does the Columbia Gorge support the largest number of flowering plant species in the Northwest? Why is that? Well, here's a map showing the Cascade Mountain Range. It begins in Northern California and extends uh, through Western Oregon and Washington and terminates in Southern British Columbia. It's a span of about 600 miles. And you notice a small yellow bar in the middle there. That represents the Columbia Gorge. It's a near sea level canyon which cuts directly across the Cascades in an east west orientation. And remarkably, this is the only place in the Cascade Range where such a canyon exists. So the gorge is a very unique, unique place. Now, on the west end, the gorge begins at the Sandy River near Troutdale, and it extends 82 free freeway miles uh, to the east to the Deschutes River, where we see, which we see here, and this is where the Deschutes enters the, uh, the Columbia River. 
Especially notice the change in vegetation between the two rivers. Wet forests in the west end of the gorge, and the east end looks like near desert country. I should also mention there are some authors that put the east end of the gorge at Biggs Junction, which is like five miles uh, east of this location, but that makes little difference. So how did the Columbia Gorge form? Let me give you just a real simple, quick answer to that. Late in Noah's flood, volcanic and flood strata were deposited, mostly underneath the floodwaters. And the first layer to be formed would be, of course, at the bottom. And uh, today we call that the Eagle Creek Formation. It's composed of volcanic debris and contains numerous uh, logs, mostly petrified logs. And then after that came a series of lava flows known today as the Columbia River basalt flows. And today they form some of the major cliffs that we see in the gorge. And next, on top of that, next came the Troutdale Formation, which consists of rounded river rocks, cobbles of uh, water-transported rock. It also contains quartzites, which are rocks that have come from north Idaho, northern Montana, a, a great distance. And lastly, on top of that, are uh, what I'm labeling as Cascade Volcanics, just uh, volcanic uh, flows that have come from more local sources. The next big event, then, was the uplift of the Cascade Range, uplift into a mountain range by tectonic forces. This, of course, bent the rock layers. And then as these mountains rose, uh, massive flows of water, since this was still underwater, massive flows of water were, were moving off the land and eroding the surface and forming the peaks and valleys we see in the gorge today. And in addition, uh, for some reason, the gorge itself formed by these receding floodwaters, and we call that a water gap. Now, the water gap that formed the gorge, um, the, a gap like that can be defined as a... Um, canyon, uh, a gap formed by flowing water that has carved through a mountain range and still carries water today. If the gap uh, is there and no longer carries water, it's called a wind gap. And you may remember Mike Ord speaks of uh, water gaps and wind gaps frequently and uses them as evidence for the recession of Noah's flood. Um, immediately after Noah's flood then came the post-Noahic flood Ice Age. We believe that the Ice Age was caused by Noah's Flood, and it lasted a few hundred years. And it was during the Ice Age that the great Lake Missoula Flood, which I think most of you are familiar with, tore through the gorge, not forming it initially, uh, but reshaping it and enlarging it, uh, straightening out cliffs, producing some of those waterfalls that we see. And although it's not well documented, I suspect it also carried, the Lake Missoula Flood also carried plants into the gorge. And then also during the Ice Age, the highest peaks of the gorge, like uh, Larch Mountain and uh, Mount Defiance, uh, were glaciated. You can see I put a glacier up there. Uh, so that occurred during the Ice Age. So truly, I think we can say the gorge was born of fire, ice, and geological cataclysm. Let's next look at the ecology of Columbia Gorge wildflowers, that is their relationships with the environment uh, seen here are some wildflowers on the Rowena Plateau. This is the place where we'll be going for one of our field trips. This is in the East Gorge in early May. And the red plants, uh, you can see a small cluster of them, are paintbrush. The blue are upland larkspur. And the yellow are balsam root. And the wildflowers would have colonized the gorge uh, during and after the post flood ice age. So it was, they probably started during the ice age and then thereafter there's been a progressive colonization of this, uh, of this gorge. And they have produced really three things. Great floral diversity. I mentioned a huge number of species of plants. And they produce certain patterns of distribution and they also have produced a seasonal progression of floral blooms. So let me look at each of these topics briefly. Uh, great floral diversity. You can say, why is that? Why do we have so many gorge flowers? 
And the answer is that the great floral diversity found in the gorge is due to the great variety of habitats provided by the Columbia Gorge. It's as simple as that. There's just a tremendous variation in habitats producing a, a tremendous opportunities for so many different species to, to live there. Uh, let's look at that <clears throat> diversity of habitats a, a little bit. Consider rainfall. Portland receives about 43 inches of rain a, a annually, but in the west end of the gorge near Troutdale, it gets up to 58 inches. 26 miles into the gorge at Cascade Locks, it peaks at 75 inches, and on the mountains uh, on, uh, you know, to the, off to the sides, it's much higher, of course, much greater rainfall. And then thereafter, a rainfall progressively declines. So Hood River gets 30 inches, Catherine Creek 25 inches, the Dells 15 inches, and just beyond the gorge at Biggs, it's down to about 12 inches. So the gorge then, uh, uh, precipitation forms an environmental gradient, resulting in temperate rainforests at the west end and near desert conditions to the east in a large transition zone uh, with all types of uh, uh, you know, rainfall uh, in between those two extremes. So that's why we see Douglas fir and uh, western hemlock forests in the west gorge along with some uh, flowering trees like the uh, sour cherry sh shown here. And by Hood River uh, you find the uh, uh, ponderosa pine, the pine oak forest. Here's ponderosa pine uh, cones just developing and the oak, uh, it's the Oregon white oak and here's a familiar acorn fruit of the oak. And then if you go further east, big sagebrush dominates the landscape near the Dalles. Often it's accompanied by uh, bitterbrush, uh, which uh, is in bloom here. You can see the yellow flowers that bloom in the spring. And uh, so that's the gradient of precipitation, but there's another gradient. There's a gradient of elevation that also produces a variety of habitats. The Columbia River runs at less than 100 feet above sea level, but the mountainous walls of the gorge rise thousands of feet to the subalpine zone where it's cooler, there's more snow, and shorter growing season. The highest peak in the gorge is Mount Defiance west of Hood River, and that's uh, about, about 5,000 feet. So here now is a, what, what's the flower? Trillium. And at low elevations, I could go out probably now on a low elevation and find trillium. But uh, at high elevations, they bloom much later. And I photographed this one uh, on June 21st, 2022, on the top of Larch Mountain at 4,000 feet. And also, uh, at the same time, I uh, photographed this beautiful avalanche lily. And here are the round leaf violets, named for an obvious reason when you look at the leaves there. So both the avalanche lily and these violets are high elevation specialists. They are generally found in subalpine habitats. So then together the precipitation and elevation gradients produce great variation in climatic conditions within the gorge, which enables a wide variety of species to find suitable habitat. But it's not just precipitation and elevation. Geological features also produce habitat for the gorge wildflowers. Uh, for example, think about the gorge. It runs in an east-west orientation. That's very significant because that produces north-facing slopes in Oregon and south-facing slopes in Washington. Uh, thus, the Oregon side of the gorge tends to be shaded, cool, and damp, and the Washington side, sunny, warm, and dry. Uh, if the gorge went north-south, it would be a very different situation. Also, we have vertical basaltic cliffs, which provide ideal habitat for some species. Here's a certain species of shooting star growing along the Eagle Creek Trail. And some plants uh, even thrive in this continually wet spray zone of waterfalls. I'm not picturing such a flower there, but you can see a yellow patch that uh, actually adds to the beauty of this scene at Laterell Falls, I think, and that's a, a type of lichen that is growing there. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Mima mounds. We see those on our field trips. They were likely produced by huge earthquakes sometime after the Lake Missoula flood. And so they produce mounds, as are labeled here. There's two mounds. 
But between the mounds are lower areas called swales. And the swales are, are right on top of lava, uh, on top of rock. There's little or no soil there. But water in the springtime accumulates in the swales, whereas the mounds uh, have thicker soil and grass growing there, and it's drier. So two different habitats really close together, and uh, that's uh, the reason why the swales are great habitat for the grass widows, like I showed you before. I think you can see a few if you look real closely there. And then in the mounds, you find the yellow bills uh, growing uh, because they required little different conditions. The uh, East Gorge also has so-called scab lands, which are lava surfaces scoured by the Lake Missoula flood, have very little soil. And then you can contrast that with uh, many soils in the West Gorge and the forests that are very thick and, and rich. Uh, so we see that in addition to rainfall and elevation gradients, the geological features uh, add variety to the gorge habitats. Well, that concludes the diversity part of it. What about uh, the patterns of distribution of wildflower plants? You know, some wildflowers are found uh, throughout the gorge. But most of them are confined to specific areas, such as the wet west side forest or the dry east end of the gorge or the subalpine zone or the Columbia River shore or so forth. Um, what, the, what is the reason for that? The main reason is that plants have special adaptations, which enable, enable them to live successfully in certain environments and not in others. So I define here an adaptation as an aspect of a plant's anatomy or structure or physiology, that is its function, that enables it to live successfully in a particular habitat. And let me just give you two examples of that. You probably rep recognize this plant as, and there's another name I like better, swamp lantern. Doesn't that look like a swamp lantern more than a skunk cabbage? I think so. I like that name. Uh, so it is noted for having extremely large leaves. This is a young plant, and the leaves are not very big there, but they become very large. And big leaves are an asset to plants. They are like large solar panels. Uh, they trap a lot of sunlight, uh, and, uh, and that sunlight energy powers photosynthesis. But there's also a downside to having big leaves. Now, here's a photomicrograph I took of a, from the skunk cabbage leaf, and you can see the epidermal cells throughout in the green color there. But uh, the arrow points to a structure, which is a pore, also called a stoma, or the plural is stomata. This is a pore, an opening into the leaf. And it's formed by two cells. There's two cells called guard cells that are on, the, they're sort of bent uh, a little bit, and they, the, they are one on each side of that, and in the middle forms a pore. And that's where the air, uh, where gas exchange occurs. Air goes in and out, carbon dioxide and oxygen and so forth. So it's very important that you know, this happened be, so photosynthesis can occur in the plant. But um, there's a side effect of having a lot of open pores or stomata, and that, of course, is water vapor escapes. And so it, um, the big leaves are, are a positive thing, but also they have a disadvantage in that there's a lot of water loss. And that's the reason why skunk cabbage, with its large leaves, is obligated to grow where it can replace its water losses and such as in the wetland here. And you just, in marked contrast, you can look at something like this. This is a big sagebrush again, uh, growing near the Deschutes River. And its leaves are small and gray in color. Uh, here I uh, photographed uh, with a dissecting microscope the tip of a sagebrush leaf. And you can see all that fuzz. The, the, yellow, the green is there. You can get a sense of that. It, these are green leaves, but they're covered by a gray fuzz of so-called plant hairs. And what does uh, all of this do? Well, the small size of the uh, leaves uh, le means less surface area for water loss. And this fuzz uh, keeps the leaf cooler. It shades it. It also retards uh, air passage, air movement over the surface of the leaf, and all of that works together to retain water or to reduce water losses. So uh, this plant can thrive in eastern Oregon, in central in eastern Oregon, in the rangelands. And uh, so we compared skunk cabbage, sagebrush, totally different, 
different adaptations, different habitats. The book of Ecclesiastes proclaims for everything there is a season, and that's true for the wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge, certainly. The flowers seen here are bachelor buttons. They're actually a non-native plant, but a beautiful one. There are actually three seasonal movements of gorge wildflowers. It's a yearly, well-choreographed dance of the wildflowers. The first movement in the early, early spring is from the east. The plants start blooming in the east, and the, as the season advances, they move towards the west part of the gorge. Uh, and then the second movement is that the first flowers appear at low elevation, and as the season advances, they ascend to higher elevation. And thirdly, in any given location, there is a seasonal relay race, so-called, um, in which species after species replaces one another as the seasons advance. And this, all, this, this uh, dance of the flowers occurs every year on cue. Here, for example, for this, the relay race idea, we start out here at, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, Tom McCall Preserve in the gorge, and uh, this is a grass widow blooming in March, early March. By mid-March, we're also seeing the yellow bells, and then in April and early May, the balsam root covers major areas, and we'll see this on our May 1st field trip, I think. And then often that's accompanied by broadleaf lupin. And by June, we have the spectacular green-banded mariposa lilies blooming. And from thereafter, during the summer, again, the bachelor buttons bloom, often accompanied by California poppy, which is also, also a native plant in the, in the gorge. Well, another factor involved with gorge wildflowers is human activities. Uh, human activities have, all, have impacted gorge wildflowers in many, many ways. You can go back to the native peoples, the Cowlitz, the Klickitat, the Warm Springs, the Yakima, other tribes. They used plants for everything, for food, for medicine, clothing, shelter, all kinds of things. Let me just use one example, which you're probably familiar with, and that's of the, of the common camas, or Camasia quamash, or Camasia, if you like. A lot of these scientific names you can pronounce in more than one way. At least uh, I hear it pronounced in different ways. Uh, Camas uh, is shown here, and it once grew in great meadows and uh, just vast areas. Here's a small example at Bridalvale State Park in the gorge, in the West Gorge. The tribes encouraged the camas by periodically burning the land to eliminate competing trees and, and shrubs and other plants. The camas uh, bulbs were just a major, major uh, food source and a staple for Native American tribes. Uh, here's one of the bulbs. You can see the ancient tribal digging stick there from the Fred Meyer tribe. Uh, here is a historic photograph of a woman working with a huge pile of camas bulbs. Uh, other examples of human-plant interactions are found in the early exploration of the Northwest. Uh, especially important was the Lewis and Clark expedition, which was out here in 1805-1806. Meriwether Lewis, in particular, described, collected, pressed large numbers of plants. He brought them back east, where they were studied and classified by botanists, who gave them their scientific names and so forth. And one example that uh, we can look at is the bitterroot. Uh, it was collected near present-day Missoula, Montana, the first collected specimen, and later uh, was studied by a botanist named uh, Frederick Persch. And Persch named it Lewisia for Meriwether Lewis. And because the pressed specimen, which had been sitting around for months at least, uh, sprung to life, it, it grew as soon as he planted it, he called it Rediviva for reborn. A Lewisia, or bitter, bitterroot, thrives at Catherine Creek. And here we see it in the early spring. It's a rosette of succulent, needle-like leaves. And these progressively go on to disappear as the flowers emerge. The, what, the energy in the leaves goes to making the flowers. And so this is the uh, bitterroot's uh, 
flowers are beautiful, and they have a long uh, taproot, uh, several inches long, which again is good food. So this was another staple food for the tribes, and it became also the state flower of Montana. Well, following the uh, explorers, and I should have mentioned another great explorer we always talk about is David Douglas. You're familiar with him probably. He was certainly involved in this as well. Following the explorers came settlers, many of them on the Oregon Trail, and the Oregon Trail crossed the Deschutes River near, the, um, near its mouth and into the gorge, and they undoubtedly brought some uh, native plants with them, either intentionally or non-intentionally, uh, brought various plants into the gorge. And uh, with settlers came all sorts of uh, development uh, from towns, roads, riverboats, hydropower dams, railroads, logging, agriculture, tourism. Again, all had effects of various sorts on plants. I'll just give you one um, uh, example that's mentioned in, in one of the plant books, and that's the example of northern wormwood. If you're not familiar with that term, perhaps you know it by Artemisia campestris variety worms oldi. I can't pronounce that last part. But uh, anyways, the story of wormwood, which looks like this, it's uh, like, similar to sagebrush. The story of the northern wormwood concerns the Bonneville and the Dalles dams. Before the dams, the northern wormwood grew mainly right on the banks of the river, of the Columbia River, east in the east part of the gorge. It didn't grow away from the river. And so the dams were placed, and the area, uh, the habitat for this plant was completely flooded. And by 1988, it was reported that there were only 20 plants remaining, and they were on Miller's Island near the mouth of the Deschutes River. And uh, the plant was, uh, the, the, the conservationists worked with it, and it's uh, increased in number and uh, is not going extinct or anything. But uh, interesting idea of how uh, our, our human activity could affect a plant in kind of an odd way. Here is Miller's Island. This is from Washington side. You can see the Deschutes Canyon coming into the Columbia there. And the X is, the, uh, is Miller's Island, where this one plant survived. Well, wildfire in the gorge is often human-caused. That was true for the infamous Yakult burn in 1902, and also true of the uh, Eagle Creek fire in 2017, which I'm sure you remember. Uh, as you recall, it was ignited by a teenager throwing lit fireworks off the Eagle Creek Trail, and it uh, burned 50,000 acres. Of course, plants burned, but plants recover after fire, and the wildflowers certainly do, and some thrive after wildfire. Just show you one photograph that I have of a vanilla leaf plants are, are coming to life there at the base of a charred um, uh, Douglas fir. Well, Here's just a list of uh, human organizations, activities, and so forth that uh, have an impact on the gorge. We got the, the gorge became a national scenic area in 1986 with a lot of protections uh, that came in place with that. The U.S. Forest Service owns land adjacent to the gorge and actually uh, right into the gorge, like uh, Dog Mountain is in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, at least in part. There are state parks like Rooster Rock State Park and Beacon Rock. Uh, there's a group called the Friends of the Columbia Gorge, which is sort of a watchdog group that, that makes sure the Scenic Area Act is followed in, in, as far as conservation in the gorge. There's the Nature Conservancy, which it buys up and owns land, inclu including the Rowena Plateau, where we go for a field trip. So they actually own that land and conserve it. There's a Native Plant Society of Oregon, which has chapters all around the state, and they have lots of activities uh, in, in that concerning the native plants of Oregon. I also put down DSA and Creation Encounter, because for the last 25, 30 years, we've been leading field trips into the gorge and looking at uh, geology and biology and, and uh, talking a lot about wildflowers. Well, now on to a little different topic here, uh, naming of plants. Uh, the, uh, this is very important. Um, there's a tremendous amount of information available on all these plants. There's books and books and online sources and so forth. But to access any information about a plant, you've got to know one thing, its name. Otherwise, how do you look it up? So you've got to deal with the names of plants. Uh, notably, plants have two types of names, common names and scientific names. Uh, here is the trillium again. And it has common names as follows. 
It's called the Western Wake Robin, the Western Trillium, the Western White Trillium, the Pacific Trillium, the Wood Lily, and some others as well. Uh, Trillium has many common names, and this is true for most of the plants. And that, of course, leads to confusion. So that's why oftentimes scientific names are used, because they are more specific, but also fraught with certain problems. Now, here's a classification. If you took biology, you remember that you classify organisms by kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So here's a trillium classified. And uh, just real quickly, its kingdom is plantae because it's a plant. Uh, its uh, phylum is, or division, is a magnolia phyta because it's a flowering plant. Uh, its class is the monocots, if you know what that means. If not, don't worry about it. It's in a order where there are lilies and lily-like plants. It's in a family, Liliaceae, which is all lilies. It's in a genus, which is a group of lilies, and it has a certain species name, Ovatum. Well, um, how do you write a scientific name, given that? Well, here's three rules, real simple. And it's good to, if you're going to deal with these books and so forth, it's good to know something about scientific names. So if you want to write the name of Trillium correctly, you write down the genus. The genus was on your list. Genus says Trillium. Simple. You write it down with a capital letter. And then the next thing you do is you write the species name, which is Ovatum, with a small letter. And the third thing you do is you either underline, as my first example shows, each word separately, or you put it in italics and don't underline it. That's the proper way to write a scientific name. Historical note, uh, the specimen, now I mentioned Frederick Persch. He studied plants that Lewis and Clark brought back. I think he named 130 species or something like that. But the type specimen that Lewis and Clark brought back uh, the records say, was collected on the rapids of the Columbia River on April 10th, 1806. And on 1806, on April 10th, where were they? Well, they were near Cascade Locks. And so the rapids on the Columbia were the huge rapids that were at Cascade Locks before they you know, were covered over uh, by water when Bonneville Dam went in. So that's where Lewis and Clark collected the specimen, and Persh studied it. Um, there is one and only one field guide that's devoted to the wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge, and this is it, Wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge uh, by Russ Jolly, published in 1988 by Oregon Historical Society. If anybody's interested, I got some used copies in the back if you want to purchase one of those. Here's the author, Russ Jolly. He was a biochemist and a researcher at Oregon Health Sciences University, also an expert in botany of the Columbia Gorge. And he often would hike with clippers and saw in hand to maintain trails, as we see here. Uh, and here's a page from his wildflower book. Uh, it's uh, got a photograph. You can see the top one is the western wake, wake robin, or robin, or Trillium ovatum. And this book crams in a lot of information. So what he says about the western wake, wake robin, or Trillium, is, is this. He gives its scientific name, he gives its common name, he gives its family, he has a photograph, he has an abundance number, whether it's common or rare, that's important to know. He gives the type of habitat it's in. He also gives times when it's blooming, like it blooms uh, in late March and along the scenic highway near Bridal Vale in early June, and the, it's at blooming at the top of Larch Mountain. He gives place names for uh, all of these things which are defined in the back of the book, and there's a map for all the place names that he uses. And he also has recommended field trips. If you want to see the western wake, wake robin and other species, you go to Lower Tanner Creek Road on April 8th. Uh, so it's very specific, and it's a very useful book. However, there's a problem. I call this taxonomic chaos. Taxonomy is the division of biology where you discover, classify, describe, uh, and name organisms. And uh, since 1988, when Jolly's book was published, there's been an excessive, at least in my mind, an excessive number of changes in plant classification and scientific names. And so that's why I put down taxonomic chaos. 
Uh, I'll give you an example here. I don't expect you can read that page there, but I just typed out the lilies in Jolly's book. He had 36 species in 1988, and they're all listed there and uh, on, the, on the page to the right, along with their genus name. Now, here's the way it is currently. His book hasn't changed, but here I just pen, uh, drew this in. in. The two boxes that are colored, uh, surrounded by the colored markings, those are the lilies that persist. Uh, and uh, Trillium is not one of them. Trillium is no longer a lily. And so there are now uh, 36 species and divided into five families where they were just uh, one family before. And 14 of the scientific names have been changed in one way or another. So taxonomic chaos, uh, confusion. You remember, Steve, we learned all these names. We memorized them back in the 90s. We got them down. Eh, you know. Anyways. I don't know, the, the major, what well, you say, why is this? They're, they're doing a lot of classification based on DNA, which wasn't done before. They used to classify by how a plant looks, it's morphology. But now it's a lot on DNA and other things as well. I also wonder if there's an issue here, and I don't have an exact answer, but you know, in, from an evolution point of view, if, some, if two plants are similar in some way, various possible ways, they would say they share common ancestry. They're related. There's something called convergent evolution I'm not getting into. From biblical creation point of view, if two plants look alike in some ways, and that we might also say they share common ancestry. In other words, we would be thinking they're in the same created kind. But we have another option. There can be similarities between extremely dissimilar, dissimilar organisms. And those similarities are, are probably due to the fact that we share a common creator, or they share a common creator. And of course, the evolution community ignores that sharing the similarities due to a common creator, and strictly says everything that is similar reflects common ancestry of some sort. So th does that enter into part of this uh, confusion in the taxonomy? I don't know. We need a barominologist, creationist, who studies this sort of thing to look at it. Current information, if you want to just be up to date on the current names and so forth, the best place I know of is to go to Oregon Flora, Oregon Flora uh, website, and they have all kinds of things. They have a plant identifier to help you identify the species. They have up-to-date classification and scientific names, maps, photos, links to other resources. It's a great resource, totally secular, but uh, it's a lot of information available there. And with that, those spring foliage uh, leaves remind me it's time for our break. Uh, just to mention on the back table, men, and that we might have the sense enough to do the thing in the right way so as not to mar what God has, had put here. In that gorge to the east were hidden waterfalls and mountain crags, dark wooded, fern clad covers and all else that a wise creator chose to make for the pleasure and enjoyment of the children of men. I think that's a good quote. Well, let's uh, do the final bit of this. If you were wondering what that is, that is the foliage, spring foliage, of the great hound's tongue. And the leaves are sort of rough and large, and I guess they look like a dog's tongue to some people. And in the spring, it has these beautiful, small, blue flowers. It's in the borage family, and uh, those are sort of typical-looking flowers. It'd be like a forget-me-not would be in the same family. Its scientific name used to be Sinoglossum grande. It's kind of, I like that. But they changed it. It's now Adelinia grandis. I like the former one. I wanted to spend just a little time on the hazards of wildflower hunting. Uh, not that it's a highly dangerous activity, but Russ Jolly in his book spends a little time on asking people to be cautious. And then here's a modified list of his areas in which you need to be cautious. The first is driving and parking, and what can I say, the gorge is uh, overrun with people at times, and there's lots of folks out there. 
And we've uh, noticed some issues on the Washington side in particular with people parking along the road and then pulling out and there's been some crashes because the, you park along a busy highway, you want to be careful. And of course, here's a view of uh, Multnomah Falls and uh, all the cars that they get. I'm also told that um, this summer we're not going to have the more restrictive use of the Columbia River, Columbia Gorge Scenic Highway, uh, and they're going to uh, have rules regarding Multnomah Falls, but the rest of it you don't need uh, to register online as we did last summer. Well, secondly, is cliffs. There's lots of cliffs, basalt cliffs. And this is the arch at Catherine Creek, and there's many other cliffs, but uh, you can occasionally there's somebody that falls off one of these and gets injured. We've never had it happen, but we had one, one episode uh, I'll mention. Uh, early, it was in the 1990s, I guess, when we were starting doing trips, we had a couple of young, young gentlemen, preteens, who uh, we noticed had a fairly sizable pack, and we got up above this arch on the plateau above there, and pretty soon they disappeared. So we went looking for them and found them, and they were t had taken a long rope out of that pack and were tying it to a small tree and planning to rappel down the cliff. I asked them about that, and they said, well, we did it on the, the tree in our backyard. It shouldn't be a... Their mother was appropriately horrified, and we put an end to it. So you never know what's, what can happen. Uh, the... Um, plant here you recognize as what? Poison oak. And in the spring it uh, has beautiful leaves that are reddish in color because the chlorophyll hasn't been pumped into the leaves yet. And by summer, of course, they have a lot of chlorophyll in them, are photosynthesizing well, and, uh, and they have green leaves. And then in the fall, again, the chlorophyll gets pumped out of them and you get the red leaves back again. Uh, so it has that sequence. And in the wintertime, there are the berries, the fruit of this plant. And uh, even in the wintertime, if you uh, get in and break these twigs and so forth, you can get uh, a skin uh, a dermatitis from, from these twigs and from these berries. So poison oak needs to be observed and watched for. And uh, there are some ticks in the gorge, particularly in the spring. And this is the black leg tick, which has, uh, can carry uh, uh, Legionnaires, or, or excuse me, uh, Lyme disease. And there's been a few cases of uh, Lyme disease in the state of Oregon and a small number from the Columbia Gorge, but it's not a huge problem. There aren't very many cases. And we do take precautions, and on each of these trips, we try to describe what you should do to protect yourself you know, from some of these hazards. And then I'll mention one other hazard. When you go to uh, the Memeluz rest area on I-84, you'll see these signs, watch out for rattlesnakes. Now, I've encountered uh, rattlesnakes at uh, Dog Mountain and Catherine Creek and Rowena Plateau and along the Deschutes River in particular. Here's one that's uh, at Rowena Plateau. Uh, they are slow moving, not aggressive. I've never had a problem with one of them. Uh, and I found this one coiled along the trail, and it, uh, I photographed it several times, and then it started to get a little uneasy and decided it wanted to move off to some more secretive, dark, hidey hole, which it did, right under my pack. <laughs> so so uh, there, there he is. I took, took some more photographs and uh, carefully lifted up my pack, and off he went, so not a problem. If he had gone in the pack, it would have been more difficult, I think. So especially if I hadn't noticed that he had gone in the pack. This is what you'll more commonly see since we're on snakes. It's the gopher snake. It's a nice, easy-to-handle snake, and uh, we enjoy finding them. And there's actually one snake that is uh, beautiful and colorful. It's a wildflower. And there it is, the California mountain king snake at Catherine Creek. You don't see those very often, but occasionally uh, we do. Well, last little bit here. I've mentioned the idea that there's a tremendous number of resources that contain information on these plants. And if you're curious and want to know something about these plants, you know, other than just their name, you can dig into it. But the key to 
finding any of the information is that you, of course, need to know the name of the plant, the common name, or better yet, the scientific name, and we've talked a little bit about that. Let me just show you a couple of plants now and uh, what sorts of things you can learn about them that you might not know. So here is our uh, beautiful um, Pacific Bleeding Heart. It blooms in the West Gorge in the spring, and the flowers are heart-shaped, as we see here, with these two spurs sticking out of the tip. Uh, it has a scientific name, Dicentra formosa, and Dicentra apparently in Greek means two spurs, and formosa is uh, Latin for beautiful, I'm told. And here we see, uh, a little later on, the seed pod protrudes from, from the flower. And uh, when it's uh, ripe, uh, you can open it up, and it's filled with these sort of strange-looking seeds. And here I photographed one with a dissecting microscope, and you can see the brown part looks like a pretty typical seed, but it's got this other stuff glommed onto it. And uh, that other stuff has a name. It's an eleosome. And so, what is that? Um, the definition of an eleosome is it's a tasty, nutrient-rich appendage attached to seeds of certain species of plants. In other words, it's ant food. <laughs> and bleeding, think about this, bleeding hearts live on the moist, densely vegetated forest floors of the West Gorge and elsewhere. And there's little wind down there to disperse the seeds. They can't blow around like your dandelion seeds do, and so they have to have a way of seed dispersal, and this is a rather ingenious method. The, uh, the whole method, it goes by a term, uh, mycocori, seed dispersal by ants. So worker ants are attracted to this tasty appendage, and they carry it, and, and of course they attach seed into their underground tunnels where it becomes food for the ant larvae, and then the seed is left there, in other words, it's planted, and it's in underground, and it's in rich soil, and it germinates. So it's a rather ingenious way of, uh, uh, of dispersing seeds in a forest where there's not much wind around to do the job. Uh, other plants in the forest do that also, the Dutchman's breeches. You know, it looks like a pair of Dutchman's pants is upside down on the clothesline. And uh, that's a similar plant, and that's the same type of uh, seed dispersal as the western Cordalis and also our trillium. It's the same type of seed dispersal by ants. So that's just one little tidbit you can find by looking up uh, something about uh, the, the bleeding heart or these other plants. Let me skip over just a little bit here that, uh, uh, for lack of time. Let's just talk about this one. In June, in the East Gorge, you often will see this blue, blue flowering shrub. It's a woody shrub uh, plant, and it's called deer brush. It has a scientific name, it's written up there, Ceanothus integeramus. A lot of people just call this Ceanothus as well. And deer find it very palatable, hence its name. And if you research deer brush or Ceanothus, you find it's kind of an interesting plant. And here's why it's interesting. Uh, it, uh, in the late summer or fall, it has formed seed capsules, and when they get uh, really dry and they're ripe and they're dry, the pressures build up in them, and they actually explode, and when they explode, they, they shoot out the seeds uh, 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 some distance. And those forcibly ejected seeds then land on the soil, but they don't start to grow into plants. They don't germinate. In fact, what they usually do is they get incorporated into the soil, or what is called the seed bank in the soil, and they can remain in the soil for decades. Some people say up to 100 years. I don't know exactly if that's accurate, but for decades they can remain there until one something happens, and that something has to be fire. So fire comes along, and it scarifies the seed. It, 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 at the, at a, the proper temperature, it, it removes or damages the outer covering of the seed, uh, which um, would help it to be able to start growing, to germinate. But after the fire, they still don't germinate, which makes good sense, because when do fires come? Late summer and fall. If a seed starts to grow then, it's going to be killed by winter. 
So this seed not only has to have the fire come through to, to scarify the seed, it then has to have a cold period, and this is called stratification, a cold period of a couple, three months, and then in the spring it's ready to start growing, and it does, and it germinates and produces new, uh, a new plant. So that's quite an interesting sequence of things. Now the plant, when it matures, also is helpful in this uh, post-fire uh, environment because the, the uh, Ceanothus is a nitrogen-fixing plant. It grows little nodules on its roots. The nodules house certain bacteria that produce the chemical reaction we call nitrogen fixation. It takes nitrogen from the air and incorporates it into a compound that is like fertilizer that plants can use. So this benefits the Ceanothus and it benefits all the other recovering plants in the area following a forest fire. So, uh, Many of these plants are rather amazing uh, in, their, in, their, in their beauty, in their design, in the ecology of where they live and how they live in the certain places they're at, how they interact with other species of organisms, lots and lots of interesting things. And all of it, I would suggest, is by design, not uh, chance, mutations, and so forth. That uh, These things are designed in a particular way to be very successful. So let me just um, uh, close with a photo and a passage of scripture. Here's a photo. I have a card of the, a postcard of this in the back. It's a beautiful plant. One of the prettiest plants, I think, in the gorge. And of course, it's an orchid. And there's about 19 species of orchids in the gorge. They're small. They're not big like you find in the tropics. But this one is called deer's head, or fairy slipper, or calypso orchid, and it has other names. And uh, it is, is gorgeous, and it's like a small jewel on the forest floor. Of course, you have to get down on hands and knees and so forth and get dirty probably to see it, but it's well worth the effort. And the scripture I'll leave you with is uh, Psalm 111, verse 2, Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. And certainly one of the great works of the Lord is his creation and sustaining of plant life, and it is good for us to delight in it and to ponder, that is, think about it, about its significance, as we have attempted to do this morning with the wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge. So, thank you very much, and I'm, I think we'll have a little time of question and answer.